Okay, so if you come up, we're going to assess something that we found in her squat. She doesn't necessarily have any symptoms, but out of her squat, we're able to, to derive some functional things. And this goes to the point, or goes to the concept that just because an articulation has no pain, it doesn't mean it's a healthy articulation. You can't use pain as an indicator of articular health, okay, because you'll miss a lot of things. So if I get her to do a full squat and sit all the way down, can you go ahead and do that? So okay. separate, spread the legs, do whatever you have to do, you turn to do whatever. So you want to go into a full squat. Now, when she goes into a full squat, what we're going to notice, you're going to stay like this. What we notice here is the amount of external rotation that she has in her feet. Okay, now come back up. Or in her ankles. Now, what I want you to do, instead of going so far out, I want to see what happens when you go out to the suggested 30 degrees. Okay? Now I want you to squat down. Okay, so you can see that her balance is completely lost. So this is a common finding. And what we'll find is if I force her down in that 30 degrees, or if I if I tell her to go down with her feet out 30 degrees, if she doesn't want to fall, she's going to have to inch her way into more external rotation. So this is a great indication or a great way to show that she probably lacks dorsiflexion in the ankle mortis joint. So if I get you on the table, I'm going to look at the ankle mortis joint a little bit, a little bit more uh, specifically. So if you come in here, you'll notice that when I go to push her into dorsiflexion, she barely gets to the neutral point before she has a lock in dorsiflexion. Now, Many people would say that this is not something you can fix, maybe because her arch is too high, for example. If you're a supinator, you say you can't fix your dorsiflexion, and that's not true. Even though her dorsiflexion is being stopped by the fact that the ankle mortis joint, or the talus, is abutting into the tibia, tibia and fibula, if you work it progressively enough into dorsiflexion, and you constantly try to splay the tib-fib, you will eventually make enough room via progressive adaptation in order that the mortise will accept the head of the talus. Okay? Now why is this so important for her? It's important for her, even though she is not symptomatic, because of another finding that we found, which was down here. How old are you? 23. So we have a 23-year-old patient who is starting to get osteoarthritic development in the big toe. Okay? In the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Now, so now I have to assess what's going on in the big toe. When you start to get enlargement of that joint, you're going to find one of two things. You're going to find her in the hypermobile stage or in the hypomobile stage. The hypermobile stage, you'll find obviously an incredible amount of dorsiflexion. If I check her dorsiflexion, it's limited. Okay? So that's just plain dorsiflexion. If I check her functional dorsiflexion, which is to block her metatarsal phalangeal joint in order to mimic the ground when you're walking, now I realize she has absolutely no extension of the big toe. And I'm noticing that she's starting to get a, valid, uh, a valgus positioning of the toe. So how does this relate to this? Obviously she wasn't born with degeneration in her great toe. But this is probably something that has been with her since she was born. She doesn't have a lot of dorsiflexion. Now if you don't have the necessary dorsiflexion when you're walking, that heel is going to come up a lot faster and you're going to start to plant or to force dorsiflexion in the great toe a lot sooner. So chronically, if you completely keep forcing passive dorsiflexion in the great toe, eventually it is going to start to wear down. Okay? So what happens when now we have no dorsiflexion in the ankle and we start to get hypo mobility in the great toe? You have to complete your hip extension to walk. So what is the person going to do? Instead of walking forward, she's going to start to turn her foot in this position and roll off the inside of the toe. What's that going to cause? That's going to cause the valgus positioning of the toe. So, in order to save this lower kinetic chain, we're not only going to have to work on mobility, notice I didn't say passive flexibility. We have to work on the mobility of the great toe, and we have to go to the source and start to correct for that dorsiflexion of the ankle mortis. If I go in and start to palpate this, this uh, ankle as well, what I also find is that her foot is always turned in. So her calcaneus is always turned in. But I cannot take her subtalar joint and turn it out. So I cannot evert her subtalar joint, which is another problem.
So the question is how to load herself into that position. One of the best ways to, to progressively adapt that tissue is to sit in a squat position. So when you sit in a squat position, you tend to be like this. So what you're going to do is in this position, you're going to try inch by inch to bring those feet in. Just enough so that you can maintain balance. And then what I want you to do is I want you to actively use your anterior compartment muscles to pull you forward. Okay, so you're going to purposefully transmit, trend, uh, bring your knees over your toes while you're contracting these muscles, and then you're going to try to sit in that position. When you can't hold anymore, you're going to push yourself back, and then you're going to bring yourself forward again actively because you want active mobility. As you get better at it, you're going to start to bring your feet in a little bit more, and eventually you're going to get your feet into that 30 degree range, which means that we have progressively adapted the connective tissue and we have increased the splay between your tibia and fibula, allowing that ankle mortis joint to extend. Okay? Further than that, we now have to work on your toe. So as a, in addition to getting the toe released, we want to take the toe which is hypomobile and we want to improve the mobility. Most people would prescribe stretching of the big toe. That is not going to help. Even if you were to passively get some flexibility back in your great toe, in the long run, that flexibility is going to further produce generative changes in the big toe. So we don't want passive flexibility, we want mobility. So, like I said before, we're going to try to get that big toe up against a, uh, it could be a, a, a leg or a door jam or whatever. We're going to work on holding it for longer periods of time, but then we're actually going to use pails and rails contracted. So we're going to work on um, actually trying to take control of that dorsiflexion and range of motion using progressive angular asymmetric loading as well as regressive angular asymmetric loading. Okay? So that will take care of this problem and we're also going to get at the source of this problem. From there, when she's able to squat properly, then we can see what else comes out of the squat. But if this is abnormal, I can't tell you what's going on with your hips and with your back from seeing the squat because you're going to compensate in order to allow that to occur. How else is it going to affect you? Well, if you have to get your toes that far out, you're eventually going to start to degenerate the inside of your knee. Because that's obviously going to put torsional stress and shear stress into the knee. If that happens, then you're going to, that's going to translate up into the, into the hips, going to translate up into the back. Okay? So that's why we're going to focus here first. In addition, of course, we're going to talk about intrinsic foot strengthening. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, which I will always say, there's not a patient in your practice who should not be given intrinsic foot strengthening work. Not a single one. Because everyone needs work on intrinsic foot strength. Okay?